Hi, this is Krista Walsh. Hey, this is Daniel Arthur Smith. Hey, this is Terry R. Hill. Hey, it's Josh Hayes, and you're listening to 30, 30, 30, 30 Minute Author Interviews with my friend Preston Lay. Woohoo! Hey, everybody, welcome to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. There is a giveaway with this week's episode, but before I tell you about it, let me tell you about our two sponsors. First up is the Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. The Galactic Satori Chronicles, a thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in this adrenaline pumping new series. Asher is a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancé's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. Projecting their consciousness into unsuspecting men and women, these aliens are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Asher bands together with a group of friends, and these four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam Aliens, Politics, and Murder Only the first one is new. When an Earth-based terrorist group targets Hanaria's ambassador, two teenagers become entrapped in the conflict. Alex Vernon is the son of an Earth Independence Party representative and doesn't want to follow his father's path of political manipulation and corruption. Rika Miller is the adopted daughter of an engineer and nurse who later discovers she's not human, but Hanarian. Alex must decide between his family loyalties and saving the life of an alien he's been taught to fear and hate, while Rika searches for the truth of what happened to her birth parents. The Galactic Tory Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks and Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam can both be found on Amazon. Or just head on over to legendarium.com, check out the show notes for this episode, and in the show notes we will include a link where you can check out both of these books on Amazon and learn more about them and buy them if you would like to. And now for the giveaway that I was telling you about. This week, our guest is Michael Patrick Hicks, and he has given one person the chance to win an ebook copy of Mass Hysteria. What do you need to do in order to get registered? It's simple. Head on over to legendarium.com, find the show notes for this episode, and let us know in the show notes what was your favorite part of the episode. It's as simple as that. Now, enjoy our interview with Michael Patrick Hicks. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. This week, our guest is author Michael Patrick Hicks. Thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me, Preston. I appreciate it, too. Yeah. So we like to start out each episode here with a segment that we call Two Truths and a Lie, where you tell me two truths about you and a lie, and I try to guess which one the lie is. Um, okay. So if you could, do you have two truths and a lie about yourself? And we'll see if I can get this right. All right. Let's see. Um, two truths and a lie. So let's see. I broke my back throwing up. I had open heart surgery as a child. And I hate Stephen King. Huh. <laughs> I don't think I'm starting a win streak today. So, so. <laughs> um, those are good. So, all right, broke your back throwing up. What was the second one again? Uh, open heart surgery open as heart. a kid. Open, all right, and then you hate Stephen King. Um, I am going to say I, I actually have no clue on this, and let's see. <laughs> Uh, the only thing I can think of is, so you write sci-fi and horror, and most people that write horror like Stephen King, so he, he he's an influence for them. So just for that reasoning alone, I'm going to say 
that you hating Stephen King is the lie. You are correct. Yes. Started a win streak. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so yes, I, that, that's, that was the lie. I have never heard of somebody breaking their back throwing up. Um, <laughs> how? I guess, I guess how? Okay, uh, you know, I, I guess it's technically true. I okay. mean, from a very superficial level. So, um, wow, we're going on almost seven years ago. Day after Christmas, I had the flu. Okay. Run into the bathroom. Urgent need to vomit. Covered my mouth. That didn't work. Uh, spewed between my fingers. Slipped on the bathroom tile throwing up. Ooh. Cracked my back against the door. Ow. Um, and that was it. I was down and out for a few months after that. Wow. Yeah, fractured a vertebrae, um, ended up being in the hospital for, uh, I'm going to say at least a week. It was probably closer to two. I th- think I spent most of what would be considered Christmas vacation in the hospital, doped up on painkillers. Mm-hmm. So my recollection of time is a little fuzzy. Okay. Um, and then I was in a back brace um, for a fractured vertebrae until May. So, yeah, that is how I broke my back throwing up. Wow. And then you had open heart surgery when you were young. That is true. Also, wow. yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was born with three holes in my heart. Oh, really? So, yeah. When I was five, they did surgery to correct that. Uh, and here I am, still going. Everything, I'm assuming everything went good with the surgeries then? Uh, yeah, as good as can be. I don't have a baboon heart or anything cool. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> there we go. Still have a human heart, so that's good. Yes. Yeah, well, supposedly human. Supposedly. There, there we go. <laughs> well, for my I, listeners. You write horror. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, well, for my listeners that might not know who you are or what you do, can you kind of give them the bio, your awful author bio on who you are and what you do. Sure. So Michael Patrick Hicks, um, I wrote an Amazon breakthrough novel award finalist called Convergence back in 2013, um, which ended up getting a good review from Publishers Weekly as part of the competition. Um, I did not make it into the final five, but I got pretty darn close. Um, Ended up self-publishing that wrote a sequel to it called Emergence. So those two novels make up what is collectively the sci-fi cyberpunk dreamer series, DRMR. Um, And I've just been kind of going ever since. So the last four years, I've written a number of short stories. One of them appeared in Samuel Peralta's Future Chronicles series, The Cyborg Chronicles, which was a short story set in the dreamer world. Um, and then a couple other short stories that have appeared in various anthologies, um, which are going to be released, re-released soon under Sam Peralta's Future Chronicles. There will be No Way Home and Crime and Punishment. Um, and I've got the story or two with Daniel Arthur Smith, who did the Tales from the Canyons of the Damned and Clones, the anthology. So you've been in you've been in two or you've been in probably two, I would say probably two of the biggest anthology uh, anthologies out there right now with Tales from the Canyons of the Dam and then Samuel Peralta's Future Chronicles. Uh, yeah, I've been lucky. <laughs> <laughs> when I self published initially, one of my as I started plotting out my trajectory of what I wanted to accomplish, one of them early on. Um, if not right from the outset, but within at least the first year or two, was to get into one of Sam Peralta's anthologies. Um, Then he gave me the nod and invited me to Cyborg Chronicles. So just getting into one of those projects was a huge event for me. That was just absolutely enormous. Yeah, those those future chronicles have really taken off from when oh, from when they first started. It's amazing the the following that it has. Yeah. Yes. And they're great books just in general. Yeah, they are. They really are. There's uh, some of the best short stories I've, I've read have been in, in the Future Chronicles. Um, they are Absolutely. 
just just pick any of them up if you haven't read any of them just pick any of them up since we have you on preferably the cyborg chronicles um can't can't go wrong um so you said convergence was your first novel and you put it up uh it went through amazon's the the breakthrough novel award um what was that whole um process how did you get nominated for for breakthrough novel well they opened it up i want to say and again it's been several years and i'm not really good with numbers in general um but i want to say there were initially maybe a hundred thousand entries it was open to everyone so if you wrote a book you could submit it they did a massive vetting of it knocked it down to i think at that point the first round cut they knocked it down to 20,000 I think so they eliminated a pretty good spread and I was expecting to get cut right away Mm -hmm. and when that didn't happen made it into the first round fully expecting to be cut right away Um, and then somehow I made it into the second round and expected to get cut right away (laughs) somehow made it into the third round Um, figured this is it I'm going to get out of this pretty quickly and ended up getting a really, really good review from Publishers Weekly that is still one of the highlights of my career here. Um, and then ended up getting into the quarterfinals where I was down to, I think, maybe the last 20 for the science fiction genre. And then they narrowed it down to the final five, and that's when I got cut, was down to that final five. Oh, wow. Wow. So somehow I survived all of that. I mean, that was very stiff competition. The odds were very much against me, I felt. I don't know. Somehow it just kept chugging along. It was the little book that could (laughs) until it finally stopped. (laughs) And then (laughs) when it did end, it was in a really good place for me personally and professionally. I mean, I had really at that point just – Entering it into that breakthrough competition was kind of a lark. Mm-hmm. I'd already been told by about 20 agents that the book isn't what they're looking for. They can't sell it. They don't know what to do with it. Or they just didn't answer at all. Um, so I just kind of threw it in there as a lark, figuring it's either that or I'm going to just shelf this book and throw it in the trunk and work on something else. So when I saw that it had potential and it had some legs and – you know, if Publishers Weekly tells you your book is great, you're probably okay. Right. So <laughs> I figure, well, I may as well just self-publish it and see what I can do. If agents don't want it, they don't think there's a market for it, so be it. But I have been told very much with the odds against me that it's a good book and that I apparently have some degree of talent. So I put it out and have been – going with this ever since well for my listeners that might not know um what convergence is about can you give them kind of your book blurb on what convergence is about sure so near future sci-fi cyberpunk um there are cybernetic enhancements that people get implanted with to record memories Um, initially began as like a DARPA project for the military, filtered down to civilian use, kind of like the way microwaves do. Um, U.S. gets invaded. California is taken over by hostile forces. A bunch of people are rounded up into concentration, well, not really concentration camps, but like prisoner camps, um, refugee camps. One of the prisoners is a memory addict, Um, when he, he basically uses memories to get high, uh, the memories of dead people specifically. So at the point of death, there's a release of endorphins and kind of like psychotropic drugs that trigger the brain. Those get captured by the dreamer program, software, hardware. Um, and when you play that chip back, you play that memory back you get to experience that moment of death and you get that psychotropic high. Um, So he's a dreamer addict and a dreamer dealer, and he kills people for money in order to hijack their memories and sell them for profit. 
until his daughter goes missing. Um, and he gets involved with an Asian crime syndicate to try and recover his daughter. Wow. Very sounds very good. Um, I might have to add that higher up on my to be read list. <laughs> Cause I know I have it. So. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so one of, so one of your other stories I wanted to make sure I wanted to ask you about why I had you on the show. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about your story from the ashes uh, that is set in Nicholas Sansbury Smith's world of um, yes. the extinction cycle. Yes. How did you get invited uh, into that project? Was that something that he invited you into? He did. Oh, yeah, wow. It, uh, sent me a message on Facebook Messenger, asked me if he told me that he was launching this Kindle Worlds um, and if I wanted to be a part of it. I have been reading Nick Smith almost right from the start, um, at least since his Orb series went to Simon and Schuster. Mm -hmm. um, and on the lark, I started up an At Galley account, saw it listed, thought, you know what, I need some books to read. This one's got really good reviews on Amazon, so let's give this one a try. I ended up reading and reviewing Orbs. Nick reached out to thank me for the positive review that I gave him, um, and we've kind of had a back and forth ever since he ended up reading and wanting to blurb convergence. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, that was, <laughs> again, you know, I've been tremendously lucky with that book. And like I said, it's kind of like the little book that could, right. um, it's got a little bit more attention than I had thought possible from the beginning. Um, so Nick and I kind of became Facebook friends, internet buddies, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's been reading my stuff. I've been reading his. I'm a big fan of his. I don't, I'm going to say he reciprocates, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very nice guy. So yeah. I kind of take some of that. Um, I take that to heart. So I, I appreciate it a lot. So he liked me enough to invite me into his world of the Extinction Cycle books. And when you're invited into something that high profile that you love that much, you don't say no. Yeah. You so uh, I, definitely jump on that one. Yes. Yeah. I did everything I could to make time to do that project. Um, and that came out, I, I want to say back in October. Yeah. Yeah. O October, 2016. Okay. Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I found out about that um, that summer. It was, I want to say in July then, and I just started writing it pretty much immediately after I got the invite um, and had it ready to go, and it launched in October. One of the main reasons we have you uh, on here is you just had a book come, uh, come out, and so we yes. want to make sure you talk about that while you're on here. The book is called Mass Hysteria, um, and it just – just came out um uh before we before we jump into it uh, why don't you give my listeners the little uh the book blurb on what mass hysteria is all about mass hysteria is all about these meteors that have been pummeling the earth um small not globally devastating meteors but they carry something a little special with them um they have an alien virus and that alien virus ends up infecting the wildlife all across the world, but more specifically Falls Breath, Michigan, uh, which is a fictional town I made up. So animals start going crazy. I mean, absolutely bonkers. We've got deers that are attacking people out of the blue. We've got pets turning on their homeowners, dog and cats going absolutely berserk. Uh, the entire town is pretty much put under siege by all of these animals. Um, and it's up to this small band of survivors to try and survive the day. Where did your uh, Where did your idea for mass hysteria come from? I have no idea. <laughs> 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 That's when you it's just started. Those, yeah, just started writing it one day. Pretty much. Um, I had just finished Emergence um, back in 2015, so I wanted to do something that was wildly different um and 
I've been going back and forth over the course of my career between sci-fi and horror, kind of going back and forth. I do a convergence, and then I did a short story that was very horror called Consumption, and then I did Emergence, so then I decided it was time to do another piece of horror, and that ended up being Mass Hysteria. Um, How I came up with the central premise, I don't really know. It was probably too many commercials for when animals attack and too much beer (laughs) and it probably just stuck um yeah i don't know i can't really give you a straight answer the idea just kind of hit me one day i just out of the blue i don't think there was any specific inspiration or real aspiration behind why it is what it is um it just seemed like a fun book to write and i had a terrific time writing it um, it's gory and outlandish and just pure crazy. So so would you consider this book more sci-fi or would you consider it more horror? Horror. I would say it's definitely horror. Okay. Um, now, will this be a standalone novel or is this going to become a series? Well, I don't know yet. Um, when I began writing it, there were... This book is focused specifically on a small northern Michigan town. But when I began writing it, there was a larger world. Um, We call it Earth. And this was a global phenomenon. And that does get touched upon briefly in the book. But I had all of these disparate subplots, these kind of intermissions that were going to be woven in and out of the book. And it just didn't work that way. It disrupted the flow too much. It took too much focus away from the characters and the heart of the book itself. So it's a standalone for now, but I do have other ideas on what to do with this. If it sells well enough, um, we might be looking at a few more, at least one more novel, maybe some short stories. Okay. There's potential for more, but we'll see how it does first. Okay. Um, and then one thing you did with this novel, um, and it's not just for this novel, it's going forward with, with your career is you set up a Patreon for, for your writing. Um, where did you get your, um, idea to do the Patreon? And then what's been the hardest thing with the Patreon for you so far? Where I came up with it was basically listening to other authors and seeing what they were doing. And I was kind of convinced that Patreon was a pretty good way to go. Um, For the kind of like the uber fans, the people who really want to stay up with your work and connect with you and get a little bit deeper into what you do with your writing, rather than just plunking down the four or five bucks for a book and calling it a day. Um. But I was looking at Patreons from like Brian Keene, who is a horror author, and he has been releasing – he's serializing his next novel entirely on Patreon, um, and he's been doing it for the last two years. So every month he puts up a new chapter of his next novel, which will eventually get collected and released. Um. I'm looking at Hunter Shea, who is another horror author that I admire greatly. Um, I have a lot of fun reading his books. And he's also going to be doing kind of a serialized adventure tying in all of his previous novels, a lot of his previous scripted novels, into an all-new novel that he'll be serializing. And I think that'll probably be an approach that I take eventually once I run out of material of what's already published right now. I've got it set up as a book of the month club. Um, so for $1 a month, uh, patrons or Patreons, um, will get one novel for $1 every month until we get caught up. So everything that I've released goes up on Patreon to the supporters. Um, they actually got mass hysteria, uh, either last month, or I think June, actually. Oh, wow. So Patreon readers had mass hysteria for the last two months. Um, and it's just going on there. I'll be putting up a new short story uh, at the end of August. Well, it's not a new short story. It's a previously released short story that will be making its way onto Patreon. 
Um, so people that haven't already purchased it will be able to get it for a dollar on Patreon. The most difficult part is coming up with good rewards for patron supporters. Yes. Um, I, that honestly is the biggest hurdle. So I think once I have run out of material, my book of the month club will end up shifting toward a serialization of my current work in progress. I'm working on a three part novella series. Um, and eventually it'll all be collected into one book and each individual novella will get a release of its own, but I think it's going to end up being serialized directly through patron. Yeah. I, I remember when I set the Patreon up for uh, the podcast, man, that was the hardest thing was trying to come up with rewards because, you know, authors can um, offer samples of what they're writing. Here's an unedited chapter, yeah. you know, and then when you finish the book, you get the polished novel, you know, for being a Patreon. But for podcasting, I was like, man, yeah, that's definitely the hardest is, is to create the levels. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it is a little bit easier with the writing because, and I have done those things. So at the one dollar, you get the finished story, um, usually already previously published. For the higher reward tiers, they've given those backers behind the scenes access, so they've already gotten some teases about the work, the novel that I'm working on currently. They've gotten unedited sample chapter, um, excerpts of mass hysteria, um, a video of me reading mass hysteria, which is probably not all that exciting as it sounds because it's just <laughs> a video of me. <laughs> so anyone that has watched me, I apologize. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely fun though. Um, it is having patrons, um, that support you. Um, so I do have a fan question. Um, but, oh. in but in order to ask the fan question, we have to talk about another one of your novels. Okay. Or one other one of your stories. We need to talk about Revolver. Oh. <laughs> Was this a fan or a hater? <laughs> no, I think it's a fan. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, so for my Why are you an a-hole? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, for my listeners that don't know what your story Revolver is about, can you yes. give them the you know your little book blurb on what that is about? Um, it's basically what happens after Trump is done being president <laughs> that I wrote back in 2015 um, that will be re-released as part of the No Way Home collection that Sam Peralta is doing. Um, it's also available as a standalone. It is a near future dystopian, um, basically war against women taken to the nth level where the government has a news propaganda network and they pay people yeah the ne'er do wells or what they consider to be the ne'er do wells of society like the homeless um to come on tv live raise money for their families and then kill themselves on television um so the so the question that we have submitted was from anthony vicino Oh, I know Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says um, he wants to know how much longer until the world of Revolver becomes a full-blown reality. Well, we're seven months into Trump's term and on the cusp of nuclear war, so I'm going to give it another three months. <laughs> Ten months since January 21st. <laughs> We're looking at October, just in time for Halloween. Just in time for Halloween. <laughs> yeah, be good. <laughs> and um, didn't Revolver, uh, maybe I'm thinking wrong, did it just come out in audiobook not too long ago? Um, yeah, not too, I think maybe last year. Patricia okay. Santamoso Hopkins is the narrator. Um, she, she is freaking fantastic on that book. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. If you're looking for an audio book um, and are not overly sensitive to political issues, because it is, I'm not going to lie. It is a highly politicized work. Um, there's been some blowback from that, but whatever. If you're not sensitive to that, and if you're looking for a really cool audio book, Patricia Santamoso Hopkins 
absolutely nails it in every imaginable way. Just perfect. I know I have it in my my queue on on Audible. Were you inspired any for Revolver um, with what was popular at the time, that being like Hunger Games and Divergent? Was this your kind of more grown-up no. tank? No, not at all. Okay. Um, I actually had not seen any of those things at the time. The inspiration for it actually came from a lot of real world events that were going on. Um, and I, I'm probably going to get slack for this, but the GOP's war on women that was in the news 24 seven back in 2014, 2015. Um, and that's kind of where it all came from. I think okay. after here in Michigan, we had legislators that barred women from speaking on abortion during the Senate hearings in our state because they didn't want them to say the word vagina during a discussion on abortion. Mm -hmm. That was their big fear. Um, And so that's where Revolver kind of came out of some of those news topics that were in, um, that were ongoing at that time. Um, Dick Murdoch saying rape is God's gift to women. Those were the kind of issues that, if you want to say inspired, then inspired Revolver. That's where that came out of. Okay. All your book covers are fantastic. I love all of your covers that you have done, but Revolver is probably by far my favorite cover that you have done or you have had done for your your novel or your stories. Who did the cover for Revolver? That was designed by Adam Hall. Um, he has his own shop set up at Around the Pages, uh, and he designed the cover for. He's done Revolver, and he did Let Go. Um, which is a zombie short story. So Adam Hall, around the pages, he is responsible for the look and feel of Revolver. I think it's an absolutely gorgeous design and one of my favorites, too. It's, it's, it's awesome. Work. <laughs> it, it really is. It's so good looking. Um, who did your covers for uh, Convergence um, and that series? Uh, Glendon Haddix over at Streetlight Graphics. Oh, okay. He did Convergence and Emergence. Those are those are two good ones as well. Yeah, I like how they kind of look like a match set. You know, you got the Convergence is focused on the male character, um, so he's got the cover. Emergence is the female character. She's got the cover. It's a good half and half. I like the kind of matched set look to it. Now, do you get – I know sometimes authors can just be inspired by seeing a pre-made cover or something like that, and then they write the story for the cover. So do you write your stories first, or do you get your cover created and so you can use that for inspiration while you're writing? Stories first. Okay. I would go destitute with all the covers that I want to buy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's if funny. I bought those just to write the stories, I would be broke. I'd be living in the gutters. So, no, right. no stories first, covers last. Okay. Always the last step. Well, I always like to give the authors um, the chance to read an excerpt from um, their, their novels. Um, and since you have Mass Hysteria that just came out, do you have a little excerpt? or something that that you could read from Mass Hysteria so people can kind of hear what it sounds like? Okay, um, so I tried to find something short. I'm just going to go with the first scene of the first chapter. Okay. Uh, Fair warning. Like I said, this is a horror novel. There are profanity. There's gore. So uh, listener discretion is advised. (laughs) There we go. All right. Mass Hysteria, Chapter 1. Buckley scratched at the door, a shrill and nervous whine stuttering from his probing muzzle. His nose was flared as he sniffed at the thin gap between door and door jam, his nails scrabbling against the wooden trim. Jesus, Buck, Melissa Delcourt said. Calm down. She had raised the volume on the television three times, but the damn dog just kept getting louder and louder, determined to outmatch the flat screen's audio. The news was reporting on last night's meteor shower, and she wanted to hear about the rock that splashed down in the lake. Sky watchers have been in for a real treat these last three or four nights, the weatherman was saying. 
A rare celestial event has been lighting up the skies in various parts of the world. But if you happen to be up late last night, you might have caught sight of a few shooting stars right in our own backyard. If you were asleep, though, no worries. A few of our night owls sent us these stunning videos, so let's have a look. The weatherman, a stocky fellow who barely looked out of his teens, was replaced with shaky cell phone footage. The first couple of seconds were dark and blurry, but after a moment, the nighttime sky lit up with a brilliant streak cutting diagonally across the screen. The meteor was a little bitty one, but still, a meteor strike, damn near in her own backyard, too. Another viewer caught sight of this much larger meteor, the weatherman said, and we've confirmed that it did indeed land out by the old McClellan farm. He continued to prattle on as another motion sickness-inducing cell phone video showed a bright speck in the sky, one that rapidly grew bigger and brighter until it exploded in a flash of blindingly white light. The video was intense, but Melissa paid the broadcast no mind as he talked over the looped footage. Besides which, the dog was barking so loudly she could hardly even hear the report. She knew the story wouldn't be very juicy, though. The farm, if one could even call the small caved-in house and toppled barn a farm, had been abandoned for ages. And since Melissa hardly ever went out onto the peninsula, she could care less what went on out there. The lake, though, now that was exciting. Maybe one of the reporters would come by to interview her. She hoped it was that Carmichael fellow. He was tall with a cast iron jaw and silver hair, handsome as the devil with icy blue eyes that sent a pleasant chill through her every time the camera zoomed in on him during one of his nightly reports. Melissa thought about doing her hair and makeup just in case. If Carmichael did come out this way, she wanted to look her best. Buckley, though, he had other ideas and sounded to be one in, in one hell of a tizzy. Dog. Slamming a rocks glass filled with tequila, she shoved off the couch and walked to the golden lab. The dog looked at her, to the door, back at her. As she drew nearer, he began barking more urgently. I'm coming, I'm coming. The dog's really got to go, she thought. She'd never seen Buckley this agitated before, but brushed it off as an achingly full bladder. Poor thing had waited too long, that's all. As she drew nearer, Buckley let out a larger bark, the fur along his spine standing on end. A low, tremulous growl shook loose from deep inside his throat, and he took a step forward, burying his teeth. What's gotten into you, boy? This was weird behavior, but then again, Buckley was a bit of a weird dog. He'd take himself for walks, put a leash on him and let him take hold of the loop in his teeth, and he was good to go. He'd wander all over the neighborhood, held, held, head held high and tail wagging, happy as can be. He'd also eaten an entire bag of mothballs, only the once and years ago at that, but she was convinced the chemicals had messed with his mind, making him even weirder. He was probably getting doggy dementia from it. She reached the door, forcing Buckley to step back, and the growl grew deeper louder. He barked once more, and now growing annoyed with him, she told him to shush. He backed up, blocking the door, a rope of drool leaking from the side of his mouth. Come on, you want it out, she said. Move. Christ, he really was getting demented, she thought. She had to lean across the dog to turn the deadbolt, but as soon as her arm was stretched out, he moved fast, his jaw clamped down around her forearm, his guttural growls sending an odd vibration through her skin as he shook his head back and forth. The teeth tore through her, bone deep, but the attack was so sudden and unexpected that the pain hadn't even set in. Shock flooded her immediately, and she screamed, Buckley! Delacour went to take a step back, her heels slipping on the entryway throw rug, and she fell hard on her ass, her arm twisting painfully, still gripped tightly in her dog's mouth. Once she was down, he let go, and then 85 pounds of hard muscle and golden fur dropped atop her chest, his face and hers, jaws snapping. Her pain receptors were firing with maddening frequency as her cheek was torn away and she smacked at the dog's flanks, like punching a slab of beef and just as useless. Her ears were filled with the noises of her own pain, of Buckley's grunting and growling and snapping. She smacked at his head, hard as a brick and twice as heavy. He nipped at her face again, her nose cutting open against his teeth. Delacorte went to deliver another smack, but Buckley was fast. His jaws took off three of her fingers before her open palm could land again, 
Get off, she screamed, losing herself to the panic. Her feet fought for purchase beneath her, trying to push herself backward, but she was stuck under the weight of the dog, trapped between his four legs and snapping mouth. The second she moved, his face lunged down into the meat of her throat. Teeth drove through flesh, crunching through thick rubbery veins and splashing crimson against his golden face. His snout burrowed deeper, and when it came up, it was with a mouthful of throaty sinew. Her fighting legs went limp, one bare foot collapsing to the floor, lifeless. Buckley stood over her for a moment, watchful, waiting. Finally, a single unenthusiastic wag of his tail and a small whine broke the stillness. He turned and went back to the door, clawing at the jam and sticking his gory snout into the gap between the floor, whining again. Fighting with the door, his paws and face smeared his dead owner's blood across the white metal finish. His nails dug grooves into the trim, peeling away paint and wood. Wow. That was intense. That was good. Thank you. I don't know what I'd do if my dogs did that. Of course, they're seven pounds and <laughs> 15 pounds. So, Yeah. <laughs> wow. A little bit different. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> oh, well, speaking of animals, uh, we are known for a certain question here at the Legendarium and 30-minute yes. author interviews, and that is, a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say, and why is he here? Penguin says, I'm here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> and then he attacks all the humans in the room. Absolutely. <laughs> he them all to death. <laughs> slaps of fury. So starts the uh, short story. The next short story you'll be writing for Mass Hysteria. Maybe, maybe an Alaskan outpost. That's right. penguins. <laughs> Could be. Never know. They're out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with our listeners? Oh, uh, uh, life advice, no. I am not the person you want life advice from. <laughs> uh, writing advice, just keep writing. Every day, try to write something. Always be reading. Every day, you got to read. Uh, you got to read and you got to write. Those are the two best things you can do to keep up with writing professionally. Uh, just read and write. That's all I got for you. And where can our listeners go if they would like to learn more about you or the books you've written? Uh, they can go to my website, michaelpatrickhicks.com. All one word, my name, pretty simple. Well, we will put links to that over at uh, legendarium.com. We'll also throw Perfect. links to your Patreon page and everything if people would like to check out the rewards and everything that you have. Um, definitely check it out, especially the – you're talking about that $1 a month one you – get all your previous releases for a dollar a dollar a month that's not not a bad deal at all no not at all um the novels are four bucks on amazon go to the patron you can get two of them right now for a buck there we go and like i said we'll put links to that over at legendarium.com that's l-e-i-g-h-g-e-n-d-a-r-i-u-m.com and just uh, search for uh, Michael Patrick Hicks or check on, uh, click on the uh, podcast tab and you'll be able to find the episode there. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on 30 Minute Author Interviews. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This was fun. It was. That is all the time that we have for this week's episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we hope you tune in next Wednesday and every Wednesday for another great author interview. And don't forget to head on over to legendarium.com and find the show notes for this episode. In the show notes, you're going to find the giveaway where Michael Patrick Hicks is giving away an ebook copy of Mass Hysteria. Also in the show notes, you're going to find the link to our sponsors, The Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker, and Paul E. Hicks, and also Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam. And don't miss another episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or YouTube, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And don't forget to rate and review. It really helps us reach new listeners. I would also like to thank a few of our Patreon supporters. I would like to thank Third Scribe, Maggie Stewart-Grant, 
and Nick Breaker. They're supporting 30-minute author interviews through Patreon. They are also receiving the Patreon-only podcast, 10 Questions With. Visit patreon.com slash legendarium and find out how you can support 30-minute author interviews for as little as a dollar a month. Until next time, stay legendary.